Thank you, Master Ray. Who are here this evening and have been part of the last 49 days of our celebration, and who all have their own stories uh, of Lou and all the ways their lives intertwined with his. And thank you to all the people who performed, and um, all of you who were especially loved by Lou for your friendship and for your beautiful playing. And thanks to all of you who have joined us this evening. I have to say, I wasn't really ready for this. I wasn't really ready for the really crazy things that have, have happened since uh, Lou died. And I've learned more really in the last 50 days than I've learned um, in my entire life. And just the whole things I could never have predicted or imagined, things about time and energy and transformation and about love and life and death and compassion. And I began to see things as if for the first time, bound together. And it's as if the world has suddenly opened and everything is illuminated and transparent and utterly fragile. And I've had this great experience of actually living in the present a state of the greatest possible happiness that I'm sure will take me the rest of my life to actually fully realize. But I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, that, but I mostly want to say a few things about my 21 years with Lou as a partner and some of the things we both learned about life. From the moment we met, Lou and I started to talk, and we talked nonstop about everything conceivable for 21 years. We talked about love and work and ambition and sorrow and vacations and dog training. We talked about what we really wanted in life and how to get off the treadmill of doing the same thing over and over again and about how to bypass the tedious PR machine that so much of the art and music world has become. We talked a lot about how to get rid of the endless chattering that goes on in your mind, the voice that's so relentlessly critical, the committee that greets you every morning with their gloomy news of what an idiot you were last night, what a loser. And what are you gonna do about that? We talked about ways to make those voices disappear. We talked about how to find new words for things and about the secret meaning of Tai Chi. We talked about how to make something beautiful and what to do when you fail and about how to make something supremely ugly. And because we were meditators and also artists, we talked about various ways to see the self, the ego, and how you build a personality and an image and then suddenly you can get trapped in that and forced to keep it really consistent. But Lou knew how to escape. He had learned how not to be Lou Reed many years ago. And he could put Lou Reed on and take him off like one of his jackets. He knew how that worked. And he also knew how to get inside other people, to jump inside them and see the world through their eyes and jump out again and write about it. Write through the mirror. I'll Be Your Mirror was not a song only, it was alchemy. It was his alchemy, his magic, and his compassion for other people which he knew how to feel and how to express. Lou and I talked about music and songwriting and the way Lou wrote was he would wake up in the middle of the night and just write the song down. And it was complete, he never changed a word without first thought, best thought. This was infuriating to me. He was always whittling away at every word and looking at them through magnifying glasses. Lou did not hide his emotions. Everyone who knew him saw him cry unselfconsciously when he heard something unspeakably beautiful, or saw something that became one of his amazing photographs. He lived for beauty, things, clothes, furniture, music. People knew, knew him also sometimes experienced his anger and his fury. But in the last few years, each time he was angry, it was followed by an apology until the anger and the, the apology got closer and closer 
until finally they were almost on top of each other, and then finally almost the same thing. Lou knew what he was doing and what he was going for, and his incredible complexity and his anger were part of his beauty. We also did so many things together. We went out almost every night in New York to see plays and musics and shows, and we went to Africa, and we looked for magic, and we went on pilgrimages, and went swimming, and we cared for each other when we were sick. And we raised our dogs, Lola Bell and Will, and we invented private worlds with countless crazy characters. We built houses, played music together, did tours. And playing with Lou was such a blast. Everyone who has done that knows that he'll just change the tempo and slide into the words in a way you've never heard before. And you get carried on this huge tide of music so full of freedom and joy. Take a solo faster, come on, give it to me. Yes, that's it, that's what I'm talking about. I was a partner in both work and love. Lou was true and he was completely transparent. I never had a single doubt that we loved each other beyond anything else from the time we first met until the moment he died. And almost every day we said, and you, you are the love of my life. Or some version of that in one of our many private and somewhat bizarre languages. We knew exactly what we had. And we were beyond grateful. Lou helped me in countless ways as a partner and as a critic and as a writer. When I was having trouble finishing a record, complaining and worried, he said, I can't stand hearing about this one more second. I'm gonna come into the studio and work on this with you and stay there until you're done. Now, this sounds not kind of ominous, kind of like a really bad idea. But it turned out to this, it was so wonderful. He just put so much energy into it. It was so much fun and so intuitive. And it was like it was his own work because in many ways it was. And the boundaries could be just so fluid. As a partner, Lou was also a witness, which seems to me to be one of the greatest things about being a couple. To be able to say to someone, did you actually, did that actually just happen? Did you see what I just saw? A familiar, trusted voice doing yet another reality check. But we didn't have a kind of relationship where the other person has the qualities that you lack and you try to make a complete person by combining the two of you. We didn't complete each other's sentences either. I never really knew where things were going. And even if I was angry and frustrated, I was never for one second bored. Now, like many people who are couples, there's a part of you that becomes joint. The part of you that makes adjustments that you need to make with your own ego and your own plans so that you can be part of a couple and make it a happy experience. So when one of the couple dies or leaves, what happens to that part of you that was a mix of the two? And I was really not ready for the shock of what happened next. And I'd never really heard or read anything about that, but what, was hap what happened was really so amazing. The part that was doing the accommodating, you know, that, that part has suddenly filled with the most overwhelming energy and boundless joy and love. And this has been so unexpected and weird and surprising that I, I hardly know what to do with this happiness and, and it will probably take me the rest of my life to just figure it out. But Lou and I talked about instinct and how to trust it. And anyone who spent time with Lou knows the gesture the one Hal was talking about. He's holding his arm up to show you, look at the goosebumps, the hairs are standing out on the end. And so this is how I accept this wild happiness and, and this weird vibrating energy as a strange and asked for gift. And we never once talked about what would happen when one of us died and what the other one would do, but living in the present, I see him everywhere. And uh, the way his life is turned into energy everywhere I look. I see it in nature, and I see it in the things he loved. I see his exuberance, and sometimes I hear his over-the-top insane laugh. 
And I see his gestures and his beautiful hands making the shapes of the 21 for him. And just the way music can get inside you and make you dance, energy does the same thing. And I finally see what Tai Chi is called a moving meditation and what Tai Chi might have really meant to Lu as he studied it with his friends and his beloved teacher, Master Ren. And I finally see how people turn into light and into music and eventually into other people and how fluid the boundaries are. Now Lu and I studied with our teacher, Mingyur Rinpoche, who taught us many things that we tried to put into practice. And one of the most difficult things that exercises was, he said, now try to practice, practice this. Practice how to feel sad without being sad, which is much harder than it seems, how to feel sad without being sad, which we worked on all of our lives. But Mingyur Rinpoche made portraits of Lu and me, beautiful large drawings of symbols of our mantra. And the mantra, Om Aho, we spoke it and thought it and tried to actually live it. And the Om is everything, and it's here in the head. And the Ah is the experience in the throat, the breathless feeling of the moment. And Lu's syllable, Hong, is centered in the heart. And it is the syllable that means all of consciousness, everything that exists, descends down from the head, from the mind, and is expressed as an explosion in the human heart. And one of the last songs that Lou wrote was the beautiful song called The Power of the Heart, which is a love song. So how should we live? Lou and I tried to come up with a lot of different formulas, and our answer to the absurdity of life was always to make something beautiful. And we also had three rules, which we tried to follow, and here they are. Number one, do not be afraid of anyone. Now, can you imagine what your life would be like if you weren't afraid of anyone? Now, second, have a great bullshit detector and learn how to use it and how to apply it. And third, be so tender. Be open to the world and in love with everything and everyone in it. And Lou and I meditated together in many different ways and in many different places and we trusted the things that the body can do, instinct over reason, and we tried to live in the present. We did meditations of our own about sound and about light and about time. And we just made them up like, look at this crack at the bottom of the swimming pool for three minutes or look at this speck in my eye for about an hour. So I'd like to just try one of these, and I'm going to show you how it works. And um, it goes like this. See how it works, just humans are so exquisite. We already know everything, and we have everything we need to live in the present. And we actually already have everything we need to live our lives. And we're almost at the end of this evening, and I, and I wanted to say one more thing, and that it's important to remember Lou 
as a person. I mean, myths happen and get created through repetition and oversimplification. And we are not meant to idolize each other, but to take things from each other and to become the very best parts of each other. And I'm thinking of something that Lou said when we were in restaurants or really good pizza places. And he'd, he'd look at me and said, like you always say, you can't lose money with bread and cheese. <laughs> now, I, I don't remember ever saying that. Or actually anything about bread and cheese, but it had become something Lou loved to quote, part of the mythology, you know, the collective wisdom of downtown Manhattan. Although... Although I'd never said that thing about bread and cheese, I had said a lot of other things that I hoped would be memorable, maybe even quotable. But it was this one that he seemed to really have by heart, the one that was going down in his own personal history book. And Lou showed me so many things, and I got to show him some things too. And during the last few months of his life, Lou was so dazzled by nature and by the beauty of water and trees. And he often said, you know, you always told me that the trees were dancing. And now I see that they are. They're dancing. And we'd look up at the sky for hours and we just like float. And I want to play a very short song that I wrote for Lou on his birthday a few years ago. And it's called Flow. <laughs> <laughs> 